Hello once again from Skip, Victor Echo 6, Bravo, Golf Tango. I have a bucket list when we go on road trips or uh, vacations to visit as many large dish or radio telescope sites as I possibly can. We went on a small road trip to British Columbia and uh, this site is actually the very first telescope I've ever seen around 30 years ago. It's just outside of Penticton, BC and uh, it was time to go look at it again because I knew there's a lot of upgrades to it. I knew cell phones weren't allowed, so I couldn't use the camera on it to make videos or pictures, so I was smart enough to take my old uh, Canon SLR along. And uh, unfortunately, the 50 millimeter lens quit working, so I had to use my wide angle lens, so you'll see a lot of curved uh, edges or whatever effects to some of the pictures, so that's, that's why. From what I remember from 30 years ago, the uh, main gate now is quite a ways away from the main site, so it's a bit of a walk into the location. Uh, this is one of the first signs you see when you get there. Uh, I like the uh, caution sign at the bottom. So as we walk along the uh, road or driveway to the main site building, uh, you'll see this structure off to your right, and it's the, uh, what they call the chime array. It's uh, quite an installation, it's fairly new, and um, I am not going to try and describe just exactly how this, what it works and all it does. You're better off going on to Google and uh, searching for Chime, C-H-I-M-E, and it can tell you a lot more than what I can, uh, what this thing does and how it works. It's, it's uh, famed, f famed glory right now is really detecting uh, FRBs or fast radio bursts. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a first in the world, actually. We were told the whole structure was built by a company that builds supermarkets. The, uh, the main curved frame is uh, just large channel iron that's been curved to uh, make, make the shape and then covered with a, a large mesh. The long catwalk down the center is accessible th from the stairs and this is where all the, uh, the feed points are. There's multiple uh, feed antennas, receive antennas that go along the bottom of this whole, whole uh, catwalk structure. In these next pictures, you can see the green antennas. I believe it's kind of like a back uh, back plane or reflector, and it's a cross dipole on each one of those. So you can see, there's just literally hundreds of them go the whole length of this catwalk. Each one of these antennas, on every one of them, it has its own preamp, and each one of these antennas then has its own cable. So uh, there's there's a large array of uh, cabling in this system as you'll see here shortly. Uh, the um, dish gets directivity just by depending on where, which signal is uh, being received where and you can you know, get a swath of the sky sort of thing of where it's coming from. These are views from underneath. Uh, you can kind of see how everything's constructed from, from the bottom side or underneath side and you're looking up through the mesh you can see the uh, antenna we'll call a ray, which goes along the uh, whole length of that catwalk. Okay, this part here, after seeing this, I will never complain or mention anything about my cabling in my ham shack ever again. As I said earlier, that uh, each one of those antennas is a cross dipole. Each one has an amplifier, so each one, ha each one has two cables, and there's literally hundreds of them. As you can see in these cable trays, uh, there's a lot of cable going here and there, and it's all LMR 400. I didn't even notice how the cables are fed from one array to the next over to the uh, center point where the uh, uh, main receivers and uh, computer systems are. Anyways, all the cables wind up to this center point here, which is a, a very large CCAN, and uh, they all go through bulkheads to uh, get into where the electronics are. I guess we should have asked just how many cables there was or how many receive antennas there were, but there's a pile of them here and uh, they come in both sides in this bulkhead system to uh, get entry into the uh, main building itself. Opening the doors to the uh, C-CAN, there's a small access area here where um, <clears throat> all the cables coming in transition over to just RG58. They uh, loop across and go into another bulkhead, which goes inside the uh, main operations building itself. So all these signals and feed lines 
I'll wind up somewhere and uh, this is where the power is. We were told when they first got this set up in operation that the uh, main facility was uh, having brownouts and suffering from power loss, AC power loss, because this site here was draining it so hard they had to, I guess, upgrade the uh, power lines coming in or something, but uh, uh, this is why. These pictures show you the, uh, the AC circuitry, I will call it the AC power that's supplied to the large secans which uh, hold the computers. There's some pretty serious power going in here and uh, we were told the average power bill, because this, right, this site runs 24-7, the average power bill per day is $400. These two large sea cans is what's uh, sucking the power juice here. There's nothing but uh, high-end computers in here and uh, a lot of them, I guess. We couldn't go inside because they're temperature controlled and all that, but this is what's, uh, what's sucking all the juice. Plus the uh, water cooling system. All these computers, every one of them, I guess, inside is water cooled. So you can see the uh, pipes going into it, the heat exchangers, the large fans, etc., etc. In these pictures, you can see the, we'll call it, I guess we'll call them the heat exchangers that have the large fans on top and the uh, pipes that go into the computer buildings. Uh, you could grab each pipe. One was very warm and one was very cold, so it uh, was doing its job. Anyways, that's it in a nutshell on the uh, chime system. What uh, really gets me is that uh, this system works so well, but it does have limitations that uh, it is going to be not necessarily replaced, but added to it a dish system, which I'll show you later that what they're going to use. They're building them now on site. There will be 500 dishes on the ground, manually, manually pointed and then fixed solid, and it'll give them better scan of the, of the sky as the uh, earth rotates. That'll be something to see. So this is what's next as you walk down the driveway towards the main facility. As you walk down the driveway on the left side is a railway track system with a array of dishes consisting of seven nine meter Kennedy dishes I was told which uh, comprise of this uh, synthesis radio telescope system. The outer dishes are fixed solid to the ground where the uh, three in the center are movable along the railway track. By moving these dishes, um, the system all works together and can emulate a dish that's 600 meters in diameter. It's uh, very similar to the uh, VLA system in New Mexico, I believe. The correlator that's used in the very large array in New Mexico was actually invented and built here in the uh, site here in British Columbia. So this is the main attraction at the site, I think. This is a, quite an impressive telescope. Back in 1967, this uh, radio telescope was used together with the large telescope, 46 meter telescope in, at Golkin Park in Ontario. Uh, 3,074 kilometers away to make the very first ever successful observations using a technique called the Very Long Baseline, which uh, is quite uh, commonly used now, so another first. As I said before, the uh, wide-angle lens makes some of the pictures look a little distorted. The uh, telescope is not falling over. At the southern end of the facility, there are two 1.5 meter solar monitoring telescopes that are used to monitor the activity of the sun twice a day every day. This data is used by industry and government agencies around the world, so I've read here. There is also this neat horn assembly which is motorized and uh, I guess they use it for just checking the elevation of the sun to the site I guess. It uh, steers up and down and you can read the uh, degrees and elevation directly off it. Quite a neat setup. The tour itself didn't quite go in this order, but we were inside the building and saw some of the good work they were doing in there. I don't quite remember, but uh, this looks more like a storage area, but I think they did some assembly work here also. A lot of uh, different projects they're working on. 
the uh, big triangular shaped piece there was, I think, is going to be a part of the new feed assembly for the uh, 26 meter dish and uh, different things like that. This was rather an interesting project. It was a kind of a feed assembly for the dish. Uh, each one of those uh, vertical pieces is an antenna, dual antenna with a small uh, preamp in between. Uh, it all all correlates together, I guess, somehow. And uh, there's different models of it, versions of it that they were going to try and use up on the dish. Uh, I think he said there was uh, something else they're working on at the time, but uh, either way, it looked it looked really quite interesting. This is a difficult picture to take. It's their shielded room, shielded lab, and it's where all their uh, test equipment is and stuff like that that uh, might emit RF and interfere with the ongoing ob observations. So. We, we couldn't enter it, but we could look through it through the uh, fine mesh and uh, see what was going in. It was a hard, hard one to take a picture of. Not exactly sure what this is. It looks like some IT optical interface, but there was some fancy uh, cards on top of it, uh, open chassis, that you can see things flashing. So just another neat-looking device. And then, of course, there's always more computers. Then there was this RF test chamber. One whole wall rolled out away from it so that you could get access inside. And uh, they pulled some of the foam absorbent pieces off the floor so we could uh, step inside and really uh, feel the effect. The antenna you're testing is uh, mounted on the white pedestal in the center and it rotates it in uh, 360 degrees, uh, both axes and uh, the test results were recorded or monitored anyways on a fancy Agilent spectrum analyzer to uh, give you the data on the test. Well, like all good tours and everybody having a good time, it uh, it all had to come to an end. The one thing I forgot to uh, talk about here and mention was the uh, upgrade to the chime system, the uh, array we were looking at it at the beginning. From what I understand, the uh, Array was so successful, but it was limited at uh, a good chunk of the sky, or, or limited in what part of the sky it could cover. It's going to be replaced with 500 of these dishes that they are experimenting with and building on site. So that'll be a good excuse to go back out and see this location again. So this is the group we had there, plus the two uh, tour guides, and minus a few couple of wives. But uh, all in all, it uh, was a good gathering. The one person who's missing from this picture is Bruce Veit. He's the RF engineer inside who was uh, showing us the RF test chamber. Also, a special thanks to Benoit Robert. He's the fellow who uh, kind of organized this tour for us. And also a special thanks to Tom Landacker. He's the former director of the installation. He gave us a very good uh, tour and a good talk on uh, radio astronomy and astrophysics. So that was all there is. We uh, packed up our bags and uh, slowly worked our way down the long driveway to the parking lot where we all headed out and had a good lunch together. So a good tour, I must say. So once again, thanks for watching. And 73 is from Skip. Victor Echo 6, Bravo, Golf Tangle.